blind eyes see more deeply to the gift of creation. But also we ask that you make seeing eyes blind too so that we can get something done during the day rather than spending the entire day thanking you for your many blessings. Thanking you for your many blessings. Amen. A reading by Ruth Gaynor. Faith lives in the same apartment building as doubt. When Faith was out of town visiting her uncle in the hospital, doubt fed the cat and watered the asparagus fern. Faith is comfortable with doubt because she grew up with him. Their mothers are cousins. Faith is not dogmatic about her beliefs like some of her relatives. Her friends fear that Faith is a bit stupid, and they whisper that she is naive and she depends on doubt to protect her from the meanness of life, when in fact, it is the other way around. It is Faith who protects doubt from cynicism. And from the book of Genesis, the 15th chapter. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I have continued childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. And from Paul's letter to the Romans. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So contrary to popular assumption, my first Sunday here was not on April 20th, uh, 10 years ago. Um, I was actually started my first full day on uh, April 23rd. That was a Monday. Uh, On April uh, 20th, this was a picture of my family waving goodbye as I uh, went out on my own for the first few months to, to come here. Uh, I got here on the, on the 21st, and then the 22nd I was kind of working at my you know, unpacking and, and so forth. Um, and, but while I started on the 23rd, I've always considered the very first act that I made as your senior minister uh, actually to, uh, on the 22nd, uh, today, on the, in the evening, when I took countryside member Bob Newell to the Carlos Santana concert <laughs> at CenturyLink. Yeah, I didn't know too many people, but I did know that Bob played bass, and I thought, you know, and I bought these two way overpriced scalp tickets to the 20th row uh, for Carlos Santana as a treat to myself for my new, new position, so Bob graciously joined me. I must confess I had no idea it was running through Bob's mind when he saw his new senior minister standing in the aisle the whole time dancing, totally playing air guitar with Carlos Santana, and I don't know what he <laughs> would have thought uh, back then, but um, it's, to me it is a supremely delicious coincidence that here on the very night, 10 years later, 
many of us will be showing up to CenturyLink again, only it won't be Carlos Santana on stage. It will be Countryside Community United Church of Christ, along with the American Muslim Institute and Temple Israel, celebrating the formation of the Tri-Faith Initiative. So give yourselves a hand. You're way cooler than Carlos Santana, and I'm a big Carlos Santana fan. Pretty cool. Now, 10 years ago, I had actually, while the Tri-Faith existed, when I came here, I'd never heard of it before. So Tri-Faith was certainly never part of my plan for countryside, nor was it part of your plan for me. And yet, you know the old adage, the surest way to make God laugh, to make plans, right? I have the feeling that God's going to be chuckling tonight as we gather at the Tri-Faith. You know, that relationship actually between uh, faith and humor is one that is oftentimes overlooked in society or at least undervalued. But it's, it's really a very healthy part of any uh, vital faith. In fact, in today's climate where you don't hear much laughing going on, it could be that connecting, reconnecting with that faith and humor could be one of the most important resilience characteristics that we cover uh, in this series. Now consider, for instance, uh, Brian McLaren. Now many of you know Brian. He has published a, a whole armful of, of books. And for the last 20 years, Brian has been at the exact center of every major development that is leading up to the new movement that people are calling convergence right now. It's incredible how dialed in Brian McLaren has been. Now, a few weeks ago, he joined me on the Converging Paths podcast, and I asked Brian, what is your earliest memory of when God became real for you? Not like you'd heard about God, but God became real for you and therefore important. Well, this is what Brian had to say. It was right around... Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll sign it for you. <laughs> All right. Got the volume? Okay. Well, it's kind of interesting because I was like a 15-year-old kid. It was right around my 15th birthday. And um, uh, and so a couple of friends of mine and I made an agreement that we were going to sneak out after curfew and find each other. Um, uh, so we sort of made a rendezvous place. And, you know, we weren't going to do anything nefarious except for breaking curfew, and we were going to hang out. So... Uh, we, we did so, and uh, we met up on this little hillside. And I don't know exactly why, Eric, but uh, my three friends, uh, this uh, gal and two guys, they were sitting together, and I walked, I don't know, 30, 40 feet away. And I, I just lay down on the grass, and I was looking up at the sky. It was October, and you know how you get those clear, high-pressure Canadian air uh, nights in October? And the sky was just dazzle, dazzlingly clear. And I, I remember looking up at the stars and having this sense that not only was I looking out into space, but I was being seen. Mm. And, and, and I, I began to feel this feeling of being noticed and known by name. And I felt this immense love just pouring into me. And I, I was not brought up Pentecostal. We thought Pentecostalism was of the devil. Um, but I ended up having an experience that Pentecostals talk about um, called holy laughter. I never heard of such a thing. But what happened was this feeling of being loved was so strong that I just felt filled with joy, you know. And I started to laugh. And I, I, I was crying a little bit, laughing a little bit, this feeling of being so full and so full of joy and so loved. And this is especially meaningful to me because probably for the last, the previous two years, I kind of doubted whether God existed. <laughs> and um, at, at, at that night, I, 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 I was sure of one thing, love existed. And, and that really became significant for me because from that moment on, my default experience of God was an experience of love. It wasn't an experience of condemnation or fear or guilt or even forgiveness. It was primarily an experience of love. And, and so I, I, at, at one point, Eric, I, I remember praying. I said, stop this, stop this, please. I can't take this anymore. It was this feeling of like I was going to explode. Mm -hmm. You know, it was 
so intense. And, and so I sort of dried off my eyes and uh, walked back to my friends. <laughs> wow. So Brian, that amazingly clear October night, just has this experience of explosive love, which results in an explosion of laughter and an explosion of faith within him that and that in that moment then really marks the beginning of Brian's journey, which he's been walking with great courage and resilience uh, ever since, ever since. You know, our Bible, the one who is most revered for having an amazing faith is is Abraham. Uh, he's the father, of course, of three great world uh, uh, religions and um, and the Bible constantly refers to him as, uh, as, a, as a father of, of faith. You heard Paul. Um, he quotes Genesis 15 uh, when he kind of does his assessment of Abraham and says this. He says, you catch it? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, he saw in Abraham that it's not about how good a person you are, how free of faults you are, how uh, you fulfilled everything that God would desire for you, uh, how you've avoided the things that God wouldn't desire for you. It's not about that with God. It's actually simply about this intuition of a love that's connected to you that you want to just give yourself to if it's real. It just, that's, that's where it's at. Now, curiously, um, now Paul cites Genesis 15. Um, there are actually two accounts of this very encounter with God, where God gives Abraham a sense of what God was uh, wanting from him, what God was, how God was going to bless him, his family, and all the nations of the world through uh, his descendants. Uh, the first account that we just heard in Genesis 15 was written by uh, someone who uh, scholars refer to as the Yahwist. The reason why they call him the Yahwist is because um, in Genesis, uh, he always refers to God as Yahweh. Uh, they, they think that this author, I mean, there's a lot of dispute, but there's a lot of clues that suggest that this author came, wrote about the late ninth century during the Solomonic reign when Israel was at the height, really, of its power and was a member of the Solomonic court wrote this uh, version of the story, but there's another version. You can even call it, in a sense, a counter-narrative that was written th over three, century early, later, three centuries later in the mid-sixth century in, where, in a time when Israel was at the lowest point of her history. Uh, the writer there, uh, or likely group of writers, um, is commonly referred to simply collectively as the priestly writer. The priestly writer. And the priestly writer took this, these accounts and he expands on this covenant, gives more detail about what the covenant and the implications of the covenant would be when he recounts the story in Genesis 17. Uh, and it's interesting that when he, after Abraham hears about how he'll have these, this child and, and through that child there'll be many descendants that will outnumber the stars and how they'll become a great nation and how uh, the, through that nation they'll become a blessing to the entire world. Um, where you would expect, following the earlier narrative, to read Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, the priestly writer just crosses that out. You don't hear that. And he replaces it with this. Here's all this. Abraham fell on his face and laughed. He fell on his face and laughed. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty serious thing that God's talking about. He, he falls on his face laughing. He can't stand it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. I can't stand it any longer. You know, I can't even stand up. Really? You know, I searched the internet for images of, of this, of Abraham having fallen on his face laughing. I searched and searched and searched and searched. The closest I came up with was this. Does this look like a man who's laughing? It looks like a man who's crying. <laughs> right? Down there, oh, I'm, I'm horrible, I'm horrible. Like, no. In fact, it's actually far easier on the internet to find pictures of laughing walruses than laughing Abrahams. laughing freaking walruses. 
I mean, seriously. <laughs> What's up with that? So if we like want to depict Abraham properly this morning, we can't, we, we just kind of have to do some like weird mashup here. You know, it, it seems a little bit beneath Abraham's dignity. <laughs> then again, there's a whole lot of people. Maybe the reason why there is so slim pickings out there is because a whole lot of people think that if you fall on your face laughing when God tells you something extremely serious about you and your, your future, that laughing your head off is a bit beneath God's dignity. Like maybe that's not a sign of your great faithfulness, but your great faithlessness, right? Well, maybe not. At least if the God of Abraham is also the God of the priestly writer and the God of Brian McLaren. If that's the real God, well, it just seems so absurd, doesn't it? I mean, when you get an intuition of this, this love, like, like Brian must have felt, like Abraham must have felt, and the purposes behind that love, and your role within that love, I mean, I mean, don't we have a hard enough time just loving ourselves, let alone guessing that or thinking that God might actually love us and so extremely i mean we work really hard to kind of you know polish up our faults and our imperfections for others or at least minimize the extent to which they know they're part of us but but we see them we see them pretty clearly and if if god sees them even more clearly I mean, is it not absurd that God would love us and love us beyond our wildest imagination, let alone call us into some great and wondrous work that we're a part of, work through us? Huh? Seriously? I mean, with all our faults and imperfections, I mean, we're more suitable for serving on the island of misfit toys, not working God's great blessings to the world out, out through us. Yet Abraham has this experience. <laughs> and it is so outrageous, so absurd, and so intensely filled with loving awareness that just like Brian has sees God, I've said, stop this, stop this, please. I can't, I can't think it any longer. Really. <laughs> You're killing me, God. Right? And yet, what separates Abraham from 99.999% of us is that after laughing his belly off on the ground, he gets up and says, Okay, I trust you. I trust this crazy intuition. I'm going to act on it. That's what makes him the father of faiths. Well, if we are... Abraham's descendants, his spiritual descendants, what makes us think that we're not part of this whole program? I mean, Abraham was called to, through his descendants, his descendants bless the entire world. So bottom line, if, if we're not laughing a bit about our day-to-day -day walk in, in this faith and our relationship with God, maybe we haven't considered the magnitude and the, the magnificence of this love that is calling to us constantly? Or do we think that that little thing about blessing the whole world, that, that that's already done? <laughs> really? Oh, I know what you're thinking. You know, maybe, Eric, you're making a little much of this laughter thing. I mean, after all, that Yahwistic writer, the one who wrote three centuries earlier, who was a bit closer to the actual events, uh, he didn't have anything about laughter in there. Seemed pretty solemn to me. <laughs> oh, the joke's on us. The joke's on us. Wait for it. Wait for it.
Faith by David White. I want to write about faith, about the way the moon rises over cold snow, night after night, faithful even as it fades from fullness, slowly becoming that last curving and impossible sliver of light before the final darkness. But I have no faith myself. I refuse the smallest entry. Let this then my small poem, like a new moon, slender and barely open, be the first prayer that opens me to faith. And from Genesis, the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, 
and he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. And then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Sarah and Abraham were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old, and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? So you, do you get the joke yet? The, the, the Yahweh stuff uh, in that Genesis 15 solemnity, God Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness, uh, did not write about Abraham falling down on his face and laughing on the ground. No, he didn't. He wrote about Sarah laughing when she heard the message. According to Yahweh, Sarah was the one who bursts out laughing, bursts out laughing so loud that the angels standing far away from the tent, actually heard. <laughs> so taken together, that's a lot of laughter, right? Abraham, Sarah, they're both, they're laughing. It's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. And yet it feels so real. They trust in that. That is like David White says, you know, in a sense, let this laughter be the first opening to faith. Now, if you still don't believe me that this laughter thing and its relationship with faith is so important and so real for, for any of us, consider this. Consider this. Uh, what was the name of the child that Sarah bore? Who, the, the name that God commanded her to name this child. What was his name? Isaac. Isaac, okay. What does Isaac mean in Hebrew? Got one. Isaac means he laughs. <laughs> he laughs. He freaking laughs. That's what Isaac means. Now, are we starting to get a message here? Are we starting to get just a feel for this here? I mean, if if if. Abraham bursts out laughing, Sarah bursts out laughing, and then God says, and call your son, he laughs. Do you think for a moment that maybe God's trying to send a signal that the, the spiritual descendants of Abraham and Sarah, they will be a laughing bunch. They will be a happy, laughing, rather absurd bunch. But you know, it's really not about the laughter. I mean, that's, the laughter is, is the reaction. The laughter is simply the reaction to something far more profound. Like standing on a clear, chilly October night, looking out at a sky dazzling with stars, and having this deep intuition that the stars are staring back at you. That something, someone sees you. And not only sees you, but knows you by name. And not only knows you by name, but loves you beyond what you could possibly imagine. 
certainly far beyond what you love yourself, the love you have for yourself. And you start to get a feeling that this, this presence, this power, this awareness, this love actually sees you as part of the working out of this love for the world. I mean, it's so absurd. That, I mean, our fractured, freakish, misfit lives, God wants something to do with us? It's laughable. But don't convince laughable with unreal. For we see in our own scriptures it is the beginning of all faith. Speaking of beginnings, let me tell you a real brief story. So once upon a time, there was uh, this Jewish group who reached out and embraced a Muslim group on the very day that a whole a, a bunch of radical extremists bombed the country, launched a terrorist attack on the country. They reached out and embraced it. Yeah, like that would ever happen. And then the story uh, continued. Uh, years later, this, this Muslim community and this Jewish community were wanting to move to West Omaha, both of them were, and they realized that, hey, if, if we actually locate right next to each other, well, you know, we could save a little money on a parking lot. Mutual parking lot. You're killing me. Stop it. No, no. Not, not ever going to happen. And then that's when God spoke up. God said, you know, if you would actually uh, insert some Christians into the mix here, you could do a lot more than save some money on a parking lot. You could actually join me in helping save the world from itself. Maybe averting World War III. Come on. <laughs> really? Just sit down. That's never going to happen. And then God said, you know, if you, when, not if, but when you accomplish this, when you bring the three communities together, you will be part of a movement of spirit that I've been working on for some time that is opening up and you will be the first concrete in your face reality of what I'm trying to do here in opening up possibilities that are not going to simply be a once in a lifetime opportunity to be a part of. Not simply even a once in a millennia opportunity be, to be a part of, but really is opening up possibilities that have not existed since the foundation of each of the three faith traditions. For bringing humanity into just a tiny bit more consciousness of each other, that we all worship the same God, we are all part of one human family, therefore it makes no sense whatsoever for God's children to be bombing each other. And it will help you create peace. Now come on, you know, let's say you even found a church like that. I mean, let's say you found a church and they, and they heard, yeah, that, okay, this is what God w wants. I mean, what church is going to move from a building they really love out of a neighborhood they don't want to leave and spend millions and millions and millions of dollars for the privilege of moving out of this building they don't want to leave and from a neighborhood they don't want to leave solely because they have a faith that says God is asking it of them. That's laughable. <laughs> Precisely. Precisely. Amen.
You know, I could just see Jesus, uh, you know, if he's pre-existent in any way, like maybe you and I even are pre-existent in some way. I could just see him sitting up in the heavenly realms with God and God says, you know, you know, son, I got a mission for you. Oh yeah, dad, what's that? Well, what I want you to do is, is, is go down there to earth and I want to, you to make just this explosion of love that will continue to ripple and ripple and ripple until, oh, at least, you know, uh, uh, a third or more of the, the earth will you know, come to know about my love through you, through what you've done here. Oh, really? Well, great. You're, so you're going to send me and what angel armies to, to affect this? Uh, well, no, th- no, it'll just be you. Just be you at first, you know. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, and what royal household will I be born into so people would be paying attention to this? Uh, well, actually, we, we got this poor carpenter and an unwed woman. Uh, they agreed to do the job. Uh, okay. Uh, and, uh, and then, well, how many people are you going to follow me? Oh, well, how does 12 sound? Oh, but it'll, it'll grow. It'll grow. But then most of them will fall away in the, well, there'll be this little crucifixion thing and you'll have 11 of them left. <laughs> and I don't know, if, if you're not laughing, you're going to be crying. as we remember on a night of betrayal and desertion, the extraordinary faith of one who would say of his own free will, simply because he heard God calling and asking this of him, my friends, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. So likewise, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we remember Christ's death. We celebrate Christ's resurrection. And we come to know that this faith is really absurd. (laughs) Profoundly absurd and yet profoundly real.